the late 18th century, one of the great historical economists, Thomas Malthus, toured the picturesque but climactically harsh Danish-controlled Norway. The tiny population that resided lived a meager existence subsisting off of their small farms and whatever they could catch in the sea. The winters shrouded the country in near darkness for half the year, and the amount of land suitable for agriculture was minute at best. Efficient travel in this mountainous country was almost impossible, towns were remote and isolated, and its citizens were poorly educated, if at all. Long gone was the age of Viking conquests, bringing their riches and plunders back with them. Norway was not rich, but in fact, very poor. In the decades after the visit, things got even worse. Plagued with wars, blockades, and embargoes, Norway's economy was in ruins, and famines spread across the land. Norway, in a lot of ways, was destined to remain underdeveloped and unimportant. Yet today, if you don't include micronations, Norway is the second richest country on earth, one of the happiest, the seventh healthiest, and it's ranked the most democratic nation. In almost every metric that measures the prosperity of a nation, Norway is near the top, and all of its citizens are technically quarter millionaires. But how? Many countries have tried to do what Norway has done and ended up even more impoverished than before. How did Norway become so insanely rich while other nations failed? And is Norway's economy just too good to be true? This video is sponsored by Blinkist, an app that condenses the key insights from nonfiction books that you can read or listen to in just 15 minutes. With over 5,000 titles to choose from, you can understand powerful ideas from economics, history, personal development, and much more. Some of my favorites include Americana, a 400-year history of capitalism in America, Putin's people, a look at how the KGB took back Russia and then took on the West, and the one that inspired the topic of this video. The Narrow Corridor, which weaves together a vast history of societies and economies to answer why some nations achieve liberty while others don't. I actually listen to this via Blinkist shortcasts, which are essentially short podcasts that are fantastic for daily commutes. By joining Blinkist, you can supplement and expand on topics talked about on this channel and much more. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for my audience. Click the link in my description to start your free 7-day trial with Blinkist and get 25% off a premium membership. These are the countries with the world's largest reserves of oil. Collectively, they account for 84.9% of the remaining supply, yet they only make up 7.9% of the world's GDP. Venezuela has almost a fifth of the total, yet it's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. In fact, most countries on this list have severe economic or social issues. Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, and the UAE all suffer from human rights abuses and extreme inequality. Russia has been in decline for decades, and Libya has been in a state of anarchy since Gaddafi was overthrown in 2011. This is what many economists call the oil curse. Today, oil and gas accounts for 27% of all energy generation. Even as the world inevitably tries to move toward better and cleaner sources of energy, oil today, and for a long time, will be a necessity. With oil nearing its highest price ever, you would think that having a large quantity of it would be a blessing for a nation's economy. The problem with oil is that it's like winning the lottery. All of a sudden, sometimes overnight, nations start to get inundated with mountains of money. They use it to lower taxes and dramatically increase spending. As the oil industry starts to snowball into the most powerful sector of the economy, it starts to box out and overshadow all other industries. As more oil is exported, the demand for the local currency increases, boosting citizens' buying power abroad, but also crippling domestic manufacturing. New politicians promise to spend more to get elected, and dictators do the same to remain in power, choosing to spend today instead of saving for tomorrow. Often, the government becomes corrupt, the wealth is funneled to a select few, and before you know it, the economy is rich on paper, yet the average citizen suffers. But there seems to be a single extraordinary exception to the oil curse. As you might have guessed, that country is Norway. But why didn't oil destroy Norway's economy? What makes it fundamentally different from Libya, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, and all the other small oil exporting nations?
about a hundred years after Malthus's visit, Norway had just gained its independence when it separated from Sweden. It was still uneducated and still poor. Its economy was centered around shipping raw resources like timber, fish, and minerals, and it had little in common with its rapidly industrializing southern neighbors. But it did have some things going for it. Over the prior half century, in the age of free international trade, Norway built the world's fourth largest merchant fleet, gaining them valuable expertise in shipping, trade, and technology, and being an important source of foreign currency. Norway had also coalesced a strong parliamentary system during its struggles for independence, and with it arose universal suffrage, workers' rights, and strong social reforms. Its wide distribution of political power and checks and balances served as a strong backbone to future prosperity. Their geography, while harsh, also enabled immense amounts of cheap hydroelectricity, laying the seeds for industrialization. However, almost 75% of all hydropower was owned by foreign companies. The new government saw this as a risk and believed the resources of Norway should be owned by and for Norwegians. A bill was passed limiting such foreign ownership and putting constraints on any attempts at monopolization. This experience in controlling natural resources would prove incredibly important later in the story. But all of this coincided with the introduction of new technologies, which significantly reduced the burden of transportation. Railways, roads, and new methods of transmitting communication greatly narrowed Norway's inherent disadvantage against its European neighbors. All of these forces kickstarted rapid economic growth and industrialization, but one way in which Norway differed was its very strong ties to welfare, education, and public industry that would serve them well later on. Norway would largely keep on growing, but being small and reliant on international trade meant it was swept up in the global economic and geopolitical forces of the early 20th century. It was officially neutral in both world wars, but its merchant fleet took a massive hit in the first, and on April 9th, 1940, it was invaded and then occupied for five years by the Germans. By the end, like many other nations, Norway was left to pick up the pieces of its country and economy. It joined many international organizations and was one of the largest recipients per capita under the United States' Marshall Plan. The Labour Party seized the blank slate and worked to establish strict social democratic rule with a large emphasis on the public sector and centralized planning, while also allowing the inherent economic benefits of private competition to thrive. From 1945 to 1975, Norway produced an incredibly reliant and strong 3.3 GDP growth per year. Taxes were some of the highest in the world, but government spending on education shaped the workforce into one of the most capable on earth. It had a strong social safety net, and inequality continued to fall lower than comparable countries. Inflation remained subdued, and unemployment was almost non-existent. Norway's economic performance during this time was strong and steady, but it was a far cry from being the economic powerhouse it is today. By the 1960s, Norway was no longer poor. It had largely caught up with the other European nations, but it was still just an average performer. That was about to change. With the discovery of large reserves of natural gas found in the Netherlands, speculation started to arise about oil being located in the North Sea. But there was a problem. If there was vast amounts of oil beneath the waves, whose was it? After some back and forth, Norway asserted its claims over these waters. The Norwegian government was skeptical about the idea of oil residing on the continental shelf, but it nevertheless started to divide up and sell licenses for oil exploration. One such company, Philips Petroleum, started drilling. Well after well, try after try, they continued to find nothing. Due to some technicalities in their contract, Philips gave it one last shot, but this time deeper. At last, in 1969, the first drops of North Sea oil was extracted, and not just a little, but massive quantities of it. A black gold rush quickly ensued, and in less than a decade, Norway was producing more oil per resident than any other country on the planet. The oil sector became a titan, thousands of high-paying jobs opened, sleepy fishing towns became petroleum powerhouses, billions of dollars started rolling in, and Norway's economy was forever transformed. But we have heard about this before. 
the beginning of Norway's oil story had many similarities with other oil-rich nations. While foreign companies rushed into Venezuela, profiting handsomely and returning little more than propping up its dictatorship, Norway tried another way. Unlike in Venezuela, where absolute power was already in the hands of a single man, Norway's political power was already widely distributed, making it impossible for a single person or group to benefit themselves at the expense of society. Therefore, Norway's government was not only able to, but restricted in making decisions based on the utility to the whole nation. Norway had also watched the oil curse happen across the world. It knew that oil luck did not mean permanent luck. Much like its battles with the hydro companies immediately after independence, Norway took the same approach with oil. To the government, the natural resources of Norway belonged not to foreign oil companies, but to the people of Norway. These companies could help explore, drill, and extract the oil, but a majority of profits earned was to be funneled to the state. At the same time, its own public oil company, Statoil, was to study, replicate, and eventually surpass their expertise. Norway also knew that to squeeze everything out of this opportunity, it needed to not only extract crude oil, but to create its own petroleum processing industry. That meant massive investment in infrastructure, careful central planning, and the generation of its own engineering workforce. It could have easily slashed taxes and blew its lottery on popular policies, but it didn't. It also worried about the petroleum sector dominating the rest of the economy. So it set a 90 million ton per year limit. Oil was not to replace the Norwegian economic engine. It was to become its supercharger. But things were not perfect. Norway knew it wanted to spend the money to benefit its people, but it was not entirely sure how best to do this. The oil industry expanded and so did prices. More money came in than the government knew what to do with it. Then in the early 80s, oil prices plummeted and a recession began. Economic growth stagnated for almost a decade, a time old tale about economies based on oil. Norway was not squandering its oil revenue, but it needed to do something more. When your economy is at the mercy of a single commodity price, the solution is to diversify investment. This is exactly what Norway did when it created its government pension fund in 1990. Other governments tried this, but their political climates enabled them to become personal piggy banks to whomever was in charge, voiding them of their initial intended purpose, to save for when oil no longer showers the economy in money. Norway's sovereign wealth fund was different, and the government structured it in such a way as to not become corrupted. The government can only spend the profit it expects to generate. That means that new politicians cannot run on the promise of spending more today at the expense of tomorrow. And it also follows strict investing rules. It cannot invest in oil companies, nor companies that follow unethical practices. And maybe most importantly, it cannot invest in Norwegian companies. This might seem strange at first, but the purpose of the fund is to diversify risk. If the Norwegian economy was to hit a steep recession, the fund wouldn't, because it's not invested in Norwegian companies. And therefore, it provides a safety net to short-term domestic shocks. Today, the fund has become the largest such in the world, owning 1.5% of all public companies in the world. At its peak, it was valued at $1.35 trillion, enough for every Norwegian to be handed $250,000. And this amount is expected to keep on growing. While other Scandinavian countries have had to reduce their social spending, Norway is using the interest of its oil revenue to provide healthcare, education, and a safety net to families hit by hard times. Norway still has some of the highest taxes in the world, but its people never have to worry about paying medical bills that they can't afford. Norway has managed to get lucky, but it maneuvered carefully and set itself up for the foreseeable future. Oil is a massive part of the Norwegian economy. It provides high paying jobs, but it still maintains many other productive industries. If oil went away tomorrow, Norway would hurt, but it would still manage to be one of the wealthiest nations on earth. Does this mean it has the perfect economy or one that other nations should seek to replicate? The answer is no. Norway has been given an incredibly fortunate situation. Not every country has trillions of dollars of oil sitting off its coasts, but its reliance on the public sector has reduced competition and potentially growth, and its cost of living is among the highest in the world. 
Norway's economy is not perfect for the world, it's perfect for Norway. But what about all the other oil-rich nations? Unfortunately, it appears strong democracy needs to have already been established before being blessed with oil. Otherwise, politicians and strongmen jockey for power seeking short-term gains at the expense of the future. Not only that, but established productive industries must already be in place along with strong educational institutions to fully utilize the oil revenue's potential. For a more in-depth look at how oil can destroy nations, check out my video on how Venezuela went from being the fourth richest nation on earth to one of the poorest. Norway, in a lot of ways, got lucky, but luck alone can often be fatal for a nation. While most nations squander their oil lottery, dumping money into social spending for votes, buying luxury villas, or sprawling desert highways, and stuffing the pockets of politicians, Norway invested its money and now lives off the interest. Economics is the study of scarcity. Everything is scarce, particularly luck. Nations that know this tend to thrive.